All right. Welcome back to the Post 90 Podcast. Uh, I'm Justin. This is Adam. Um, and this is episode 97. Uh, first, I episode think. Episode 96. 96. Sorry, <laughs> I jumped the gun. Um, we're getting super close to that special episode 100, which is obviously going to be super, super um, cool for us and a milestone, not only for us, but the the community of podcasting. Um, it's been said many times, not many podcasts in this space make it that far. So uh, we're looking forward to that. You can follow us uh, on Twitter at Post90Pod. Uh, anywhere that you get podcasts, you can follow us there. You'll find us there. Um, we were, you know, kind of not super excited to record in the first place, but obviously when when things like this happen in the sport, it makes it even a little bit more somber to record. Um, and it would be impossible to cover anything MLS related without obviously touching on what happened Saturday night um, while we were playing. Um, if you wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit first. Yeah, especially, you know, not just MLS related, but, you know, New York related too. Um, obviously with the, the rivalry with the Red Bulls, um, you know, Twitter gets extra spicy whenever there's things going on with either club. Um, and that was, you know, certainly the case uh, with everything that went on the Red Bulls game. Um, I, I don't think either of us were able to watch it live uh, just with the Apple TV stuff and all the games being at the same time. Um, you know, NYCFC takes precedent, but just... Uh, just an insane situation, I guess. Um, I think it, you know, it, it's been said probably a billion times on Twitter by now, but, you know, clearly there, there's going to have to be some repercussions for Van Zier, who I think at this point is stepping away from the team, but we, we don't necessarily know in what capacity. And then uh, hopefully there's something to come with Struber. Um, to me, I think like the most damning clip out of all the ones that I saw was... Uh, Coronel, their goalkeeper, actually talking to Struber and advocating or advocating to have Van Zier taken off the field was like, uh, it was like a game changer to me because if you're like advocating for like your teammate to get pulled off the field, obviously uh, you heard something yourself or you were given an account by somebody that heard something themselves that you for sure believed. Um, and for Struber to shoot that request down from his own teammates. Uh, and Lee Van Zier on the field. I know he ended up pulling them off after 20 minutes. I'm not sure what could have changed or transpired in those 20 minutes that he would change his mind. Um, but just, I mean, all around crazy situation. Maybe is 21 minutes like the world record for stoppage time ever? It's just an insane situation all around. Yeah, I, obviously, I think that might be that might take the cake for the longest stoppage ever. Um, I, I think first you want to give credit where credit is due i think the referee was um, pretty much as as good as you can be in that situation um obviously it's a super tough situation and one that no ref should have to be in uh and will rarely be be in with you know the just advancement in, in um social politics and everything like that but i thought he handled it exceptionally well for the information that he had um you know, he did it as best as he could to calm the nerves. Um, given what was said or what was allegedly said, I think um, obviously the other team handled it very well and not, you know, making it something that could have been very violent. Um, but yeah, I think you hit it right on, on the nail on the head with, with Struber that it's just unacceptable to not immediately pull the player regardless of if he said it or not, or you have information he said something or not, um, it seems like you pull that player until the investigation is done. I don't think that that's something that's necessarily, you know, some people have said, you know, that's kind of throwing your player under the bus. I don't believe so. I think you need to know for sure that something did or didn't happen. Um, and it's weird that the player was denying it on the field, but then later comes out, and says that he did say something so um i don't know all around terrible situation um and i think it's fueled by things like uh curtain from philly saying um comments like oil money and and these types of things i think 
all of those comments create a culture where that's something that a player feels like they're okay that they can say that. And and yeah, it curtain just, needed to be punished in that in that regard too, way back then. Or it's like I think it was last season, uh Taxi Futaz, I think it is. He on DC United with Rooney as the manager. I think uh, a very similar situation happened where he had said something on the field and I believe he ended up being removed from the team indefinitely for the year. I think he's back with them now, but like Wayne Rooney made no two mistakes about it that, you know, at the moment when things happen, uh, you know, it's going to be a black and white issue for him. And I think, you know, that's obviously something that you respect from a guy like Wayne Rooney, or when you see, I think it was in the USL, Landon Donovan uh, had a similar thing happen um, for the team. He either owns or manages, I'm not sure. Um, and they just straight up called the game off. And I think him and the rest of his club kind of walked off the pitch and it was just like a no, a no tolerance policy. And I think that's what, uh, I guess we haven't seen yet from the MLS or even from the club themselves. They've obviously made some statements, both the player, the club and the coach, um, some better than others, you know, Struber, I don't think even said sorry in it. He kind of just acknowledged no. that something happened and like, that was the statement like yes something happened uh which is crazy to me i think i don't think that that helps his case at all and i think um larger than that you know you definitely do need the mls to step in in some way because you can't you can't create an environment where things like that are happening like you said with the oil money stuff too i mean we've obviously uh it's pretty easy as nycfc fans although i haven't seen a ton of them doing it um to take this moment to dunk on the Red Bulls, you know, as, as horrific as a situation as it is. Um, but it just, you know, when, when we even allow those things potentially as like a Twitter community um, or fans conversing with other fans, you know, it, it does at some point, it all, it all bubbles up or it all trickles down. If you're allowing it at any point in the, in the system, um, it's going to spread to other points. And, you know, it's unfortunate that it happens that way, especially um, on the field. Uh, it's just, it's honestly just crazy. I think for me, like the the most amazing thing that I saw was probably the post mass post match presser from Ibo Bise from Earthquakes. He was like so composed and like thoughtful with the choices of words that he was using, um, and to do so, uh, I don't want to frame him as anything that he doesn't think he is, but to do so potentially as like a victim in the situation is like super uh, super class and like amazing to see. So. I have a newfound respect for him. You know, obviously we've heard his name around the league for some of the things he's done, but I've never seen his character, I guess. Um, and that was that was a good thing to see. I think he was a lot more uh, forthcoming and uh, uh, apologized a lot more than I would expect somebody who could potentially be a victim in that situation too. So impressive from him, uh, impressive from all the earthquakes kind of handling, you know, on the pitch, there was the reaction instantly that I think it's justified. Proves that something, something was said to get, uh, you know, professionals to act the way that instantly. I mean, it was like one second. It was, you know, regular foul, and then clear, very clearly, something was said, and everybody's attention turns to Van Zier, um, and you know, it's pretty evident when you look at those replays uh, that something was said that was just way over the line. So yeah, and. Um... Rival, rival, I can't even say the word right now. Rivalry aside, Derby aside, um, it's unacceptable to employ somebody who's not willing to make the difficult decisions. I think it's clear that even Red Bulls fans are calling for Schubert's job. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I've never really been an advocate for taking people's livelihoods for bad moments. Um, but I think both people need education um, and a, lo a long amounts of therapy and, um, yeah, just education, learning about the culture of different places. And, um, yeah, I don't think that you can work while, you, while that happens. So... And I think I think the issue too with it is, like you said, obviously not taking away people's lives for one moment, but I think Struber's actions coming out of this, even though it's been what are we like three to four days removed, like the statement we already brought it up has is not sufficient for for what we saw in the field and and his conduct. I saw somebody post a picture uh, of a DM from him, I guess like 
you know, a Red Bulls fan called him a clown on Instagram or something. And he's like responding to fans in Instagram DMs. Like, I think he just said like happy Easter with like a smiley face or something like, yeah. I don't know. That to me just seems insane. Like I could never imagine like being in his position and do really anything that he did, but especially at that point, like you probably need to like throw the social medias out the phone at this point or out the room at this point And like, very much focus on like the situation that you're in because yeah you know it gets out of hand yeah and and about the and, um and i think you're I, I was gonna say i think you're right because we've you know we've off, we've often talked in the show um me being a city fan and then of course of course everything coming up with curtain when we beat you know the the covid diminished squad in the eastern conference finals um so we've and then you know nycfc fair enough for anybody that brings it up has their history with different types of supporter groups, um, I guess Nazi supporter groups that have been in or around the club, you know, way back in the past, and the club didn't do its best acknowledging those situations. But I think as a fan base, we always have, you know, I could count on more hands than you can fit in the stadium. Um, NYCFC fans that we've met that have been super cool and obviously against all of those things, and we've played with our club the way that Red Bull fans are now um, to go out and do the right thing and make the statements like they are in this situation um but you know to see some of the dunking going on i think over the course of different seasons even over the past couple days about us and the oil money ifc thing i think uh that is like to me it's like a little bit of closeted you know racism going on too and it's always awful to see especially i mean even just um even just common sense wise you know we're in a salary cap league where the mls has more roster regulations than any sport that's ever been known to man like you know there's not uh dirty oil money as i've seen some uh red bull fans in the past 24 48 hours say online um that's fueling this team you know uh the mls is doing everything they can to make sure that that is like literally impossible to do um so it it sucks to see that you know sucks to see that thrown around it never never feels good as a a fan of the team well in the in it's something that you always thought would just be you know awful twitter banter that you see from people who you know aren't educated Mm -hmm. enough to understand why that's wrong um but like i said before to see it from somebody like the philly coach in you know saying it in a presser and feeling bold enough to do that is the same energy that led van zier to do what he did um Mm -hmm. It's that, that false confidence that you can kind of do and say whatever you want um, in a moment of anger and, and, and get away with it. Um, I did want to clear up that, I yeah, I don't, like I said, I'm not a fan of people's livelihood being taken away. Van Zier, he did what he did, and, you know, he may never play football again, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, but in, yeah. in terms of Struber... Um, you can almost forgive, you know, the the actions on the pitch if he comes out with a good apology. But he the the tripling and doubling down on not saying anything, I think for me shows character beyond a moment, and you you just can't employ that yeah. beyond anything. You know, New York Red Bulls versus the NYCFC. That aside, you you just can't. It's not happening in this city. Period. So yeah. I think that's probably. The last that we'll touch on that, and we'll kind of reflect on our game and um, the game coming up. Yeah, and I mean, it, it sucks that it does happen because it does put a you know a pretty big damper on everything else that happens in the league. There were a, a number of exciting things that happened uh, around the league this week, and I think our game was obviously a big one. Atlanta has become uh, sort of the the powerhouse team that we've loved to talk about in the past. Um, uh, we've had big moments for them or with them in the playoffs um, previously. And, and we've had those conversations about different rivals that we have in the league and how Atlanta has kind of, you know, Atlanta or a Toronto has kind of fallen out of grace, but it feels like this year, uh, you know, they're stepping back up to the plate. And I think, I think that's what they're doing. Obviously Tiago Almada is, he could sell for 30 or 40 at the end of the season. If yeah. he, if he makes it to the end of the season. Um, and then uh, Gia Kumakis, I think um, they're, their Greek striker DP. He to me, oh, I, like if, if we could have like a nine in the league on our team, I think it, I think it would literally be him, like over anybody else. 
Yeah, no, I think there's something to say about um, Atlanta's front office and their ability to. I don't. I, I. It's hard to say rebuild because it's such a new club. Um, same with mm-hmm. NYCFC, but it does kind of feel like a rebuild from those, you know, Joseph Martinez um, type of days where you just, you know, you had that team that was lighting up the MLS and, um, you know, winning a ton of games and being a powerhouse in the East to, you know, a few years of silence that they've had. And it seems like they've been able to resurrect the team again and, you know, really have stars in those key key spots that led them to success before um, being the nine in the 10th position. So, yeah, they're, they're really, really exciting to watch. Um, it was an, uh, unfortunate to, to, you know, to only see us come away with one point. Um, I thought they played very well, but they didn't play – good enough and obviously they went down to 10 men um they didn't play well enough to get out of there with a point um the goal that they did score obviously it comes from a moment of i don't even know the defense just checking out completely um not paying attention to vintage. whether or not vintage, vintage <laughs> yeah where you're ball watching or expecting um you know that the ball the went out of bounds or whatever um just really caught sleeping and that was really unfortunate because that's what ultimately costed us the two points. Um, but I do, I still, I still like the fight for the team going on and um, you know getting the goal back and fighting for the for the point. But yeah, it was another disappointing game where we're not able to win. Um, and I just, I wonder what it's going to take from Nick specifically to get over that hump. Yeah, I'm not sure. I. I feel like for me, obviously the probably the biggest moment of the game was uh, was that tackle with with the red card. Um, I think it was a, a borrow that takes out Sands, and you know Sands initially gets the yellow card, and then they go to VAR and they find out um, that a borrow is going to get his red. Um, and it almost it almost feels like to me in every in every game that we've played this season, when Sands comes off the field, it's almost like we are also now playing with ten men. Um, because of, of the force that he's been, I think obviously we we talked about uh, with player of the month voting, I think it was Keaton Sands and Santi, and uh, I was very much on the fence of Sands, you know, far and away taking taking that uh, taking that trophy home. Um, but it, that's just what it feels like. It almost felt like both teams had been playing down a man, at least immediately after that had happened. Um, the Sands, I think he stayed on for a few minutes, but... Uh, he like made one pivot and he was like down to the floor and obviously had to be um, subbed out. And then, yeah, uh, they go down and score. Um, Almada, obviously straight to G. Um Those are, those are going to, those are going to be the guys that if you're Atlanta, you have to get going. Those are like our, our Gabriel Pereira's, our Santis, our Italics, it's, you know, doing, doing what those guys were brought in and paid to do. Um, and then I think, you know, GP goes down and levels it, obviously, in a, a, a individual effort, um, which is amazing and something that we're going to see from him pretty often with that left foot. Um, but right after, to me, I think the, the telling moment that it was going to probably not go our way is even after GP scores, the pressure that Atlanta is uh, putting on us immediately after the restart. I think they went down and almost scored again. And they just uh, i don't know if we lost our cool if there was an adrenaline adrenaline dump if we score a minute after they score and you know you're at Yankee Stadium and everything with all the fans um but it just it looked like we were down a man to them um which which was shocking to me yeah no i thought we finished the game somewhat strong at least trying and in, in creating chances that ultimately it, you know it seems like like the story that keeps writing itself every single week where we find ourselves in a position where we need a goal late and you know there's a million chances to get that done and we just ultimately don't find the correct pass or the you know the ball just doesn't find the net um you know specifically i think literally with the last kick of the game almost was a chance for us on goal um so i don't know I, and speaking on going back to to james sands luckily um at least what, from what we're reading so far, obviously scans are negative. He's just in a lot of pain. He's come out, out of that challenge, honestly, lucky in my opinion. 
Um, yep. The fact that it was, it was even seen as a yellow card on him is ridiculous and a testament to how horrible the referees have been pretty much this whole season, um, pretty much summed up in one play. But, yeah, yeah I mean, relying on, on a GP to come off of the bench and show, you know, why he should be starting and why it's impossible to make a lineup for this team because you're going to leave somebody out that's bound to make an impact. Um, yeah. So it's been GP for the last two games. I don't imagine going into City Field versus Nashville that that we don't start GP. Uh, he seems like a must start. Um, but yeah, it's just this this team or maybe this coach or I don't know. Um, they're just lacking that bite to go and win a game. Yeah, I think after after the Revolution game, we obviously hopped on here. We were calling for GP to start no matter what, even just off uh, a corner assist outside of that. He looked he looked up to it for the, the second half of the, the Revs game, like a like a true super sub. Um, but you're, I, I think you're definitely right. Nashville City Field um, will be there, and I think we're going to see – GP starting. Uh, I believe Matty is suspended on yellow card Good. accumulation anyways. So, yeah, because of that, obviously, um, he has typically been the guy starting on that right wing in place of GP. So, I don't think Cushing is going to be able to, to get out of starting GP in this game. And I don't think he wants to, um, and I don't think he should want to. Uh, Matty, you're right. We, we probably need a, a rest for Matty. I think it was UK NYCFC that listed out, like, uh, Matthew, like a, a stat roll of Matty, and it was like six games, zero goals, zero assists, zero whatever, you know, a, a whole bunch of zeros, basically. Man's putting and up, six uh, games. Matt statistics <laughs> in the bar. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, see, even seeing that tweet kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I do think, uh, you know, Matty does uh, a lot off the ball or potentially even on the ball that's not necessarily resulting in stat sheets. Kind of like the the key in discussion that we see a lot of arguments on about Twitter from right. some of the outfield guys with, you know, some of the other people that uh, aren't so, aren't so friendly towards Keaton at all times. Um, but that's kind of the way it goes. You know, if you're not, if you're not doing something that is ultimately leading to goals and it's pretty evident, then people are going to have a pretty poor opinion of you. And I think Matty has kind of fallen into that role and I'm happy that Cushing has an excuse uh, for him to be removed from the lineup without making the decision and potentially affecting confidence or chemistry. He, he can lean fully on that, that yellow card accumulation to kind of buy himself out of knocking Matthew off any peg when it comes to ego or conf- not that he has one, but confidence and all the different things. Yeah. Those, it kind of reminds me of, I think it was last season, maybe. Yeah. Last season um, where Maxi got that red card and, we finally got the excuse to try Santi at the 10 uh, yep. that fans had been asking for all season. So um, obviously getting Matty off the field is nothing personal against him, um, but he's had his chances. He's had plenty of chances uh, to contribute on the stat sheet in terms of goals and assists, um, and he just hasn't. And I think, you know, with him, with Matty out, uh, Tiago on loan, it, it kind of gives us an idea of what this team should really look like. And so I don't know who do you, who you think is going to start. I think it's probably going to be pretty similar to um, to the first time that we started uh, versus Nashville. I don't imagine Sands feeling too great to play this quickly. Um, so we're probably going to see, you know, Alfredo Keaton instead of Alfredo or uh, instead of Keaton Hack. And then I think we mm-hmm. see Seagal instead of Talas at the nine, and uh, Talas on the left wing. I just thought, uh, I think something I would like to see, um, you know, after talking all about how I think we should start GP, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind keeping the GP super sub rolling for one more game if it results in getting uh, getting Ledesma a start, um, and that would obviously function in the way of Talas Seagal. And Santi on the right wing, Ledesma in the ten, in the driver's seat for hopefully a full game if he can go the full game, but at least to start it out. And then, like you said, it's obviously going to be Alfredo and and Keaton, and then the the standard backline back there. Yeah, no, that I, to I, me would be exciting. 
yeah, I almost forgot about Ledesma, which is um, kind of a ridiculous thing to say when he's probably top two players for us right now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's the perfect excuse to to play the Ledesma, and you know maybe you have the Santi nine situation like we've seen in some of these games where we've had to kind of chase the chase the goal, like I like I've been saying. Um, yeah, I think that could be exciting as well. I just hope. I don't know. I hope we find an identity. I hope we find a lineup that we can stand on and be proud of. And, you know, if we lose by a goal or we're ending up with, you know, these draws like we've been getting, um, that we can at least be proud of the team that we put out there and not really yeah. have to nitpick um, some of these decisions and mistakes. Yeah, I do feel at the moment that our roster construction is, like, really weird. It's It's weird that we can't find a, a perfect way to have all of our best players on the field at the same time being like uh, GP, Tales, uh, Santi, Ledesma, Keaton. How, how do you fit all of these guys into uh, four positions, I guess, and in a way that it all works? It, it really doesn't because we've, we've been proven that Tales is not going to work with the nine. Um, so now the Seagal gets plugged in and now that's taking a spot from a GP or uh, a Tales being there and, and creating room on the left wing. Um, obviously, I think Tiago uh, Andrade was in that conversation too. And I guess Cushing made us that we, we could move past that decision um, and, and not have those thoughts anymore. But it's, it's weird. It sucks that we have so many talented guys in the same positions and they kind of have to battle for starting spots because it displaces everything if we try to fit all these puzzle pieces together right yeah i mean it, it's honestly it's how i feel when when i'm playing fifa like i got all these crazy players and you're just like i can't yeah. i want to play with all of them at the same time and i can't um then there's parts of one player that you want and you want this piece of this other player and um you know it's it's difficult i don't envy cushing at all um with some of the choices that he has to make but you know i would like to see a start a game the way that we end most games in terms of player selection because um, I think we've always we've always looked better in second halves and chasing games than we do at the front foot of at, that's of the start of games yeah I think uh I think for me what I what I said is probably the lineup that I would like to see I think you know to me the real standout on that is going to be with Santi on the right, I think Alenich is sort of the perfect, the perfect part, the perfect right side partner for a guy like Santi. Um, Alenich, to me, was probably the the most outstanding player uh, on the field in Atlanta for us, anyways. Um, you know that kid, man. I feel I feel really bad for Tavon because he is obviously very much a show favorite, very much a a, a, a New York favorite, a, a homegrown from the Bronx, all that, you know, a club favorite. Um, but it's just, you know, especially with his fitness, there's just no way, I think even if he was healthy, that we could even have a conversation about starting him over Alenich, especially the way that Alenich has looked on the attack. I mean, he's he's just been, I, I'm excited for him to get, like, his first assist. I'm excited for him to, like, celebrate his first, like, goal contribution. Yeah. And that, to me, will be a very... A very big moment that we'll probably remember for a long time, depending on you know how everything pans out. Yeah, I mean, he's, he strikes me as, um, you know, the the Angelino type that's not going to be here for long. Um, who's mm -hmm. got a ton of potential? Who's got a name, you know, internationally that speaks to clubs that in kind of perks their ears up. Um, so, I, I I do feel bad for Tavon, but at the same time. Um, you know, you've, you've got to take care of your body as much as you can. And, you know, injuries are an unfortunate part of the sport uh, that, you, you know, you can't help. So um, I, I know that Tavon will, he will contribute to this team uh, throughout the season. I just don't think that it'll be the role that he was expecting in the season or maybe that most people were expecting um, just due to the emergence of this kid who, who is a freak. He's fast. Mm -hmm. He he plays s smart. Um, he's just an all all around great player. Yeah. 
So what do you think? What do you think for City Field? Do you think we're going to catch a W out there? I think so. I think we're going to have the, um, you know, the good juju of obviously staying away from the stadium on my birthday, not to jinx anything. Um, <laughs> I think that was a smart decision by us. Uh, I think me being a City Field media member for the first time, obviously, Johnny, you've been there a few times, but um, I'm making the trip there not just as, you know, I, I feel like it's cleansing my palate of City Field, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, just from yeah. the last time I was there was the 2018 or 2019, 2019. 2019 playoff run um, where obviously it didn't go go to plan. So um, I'm cleansing my palate at City Field. We're going to be there for the fun in the beginning, uh, most likely. And um, yeah, I think we get out of there with the win. I think Nashville's not going to get too over on us. Yeah, I think we're we're one of maybe the only club that gets like two home openers in a season, right? It's like right. I, I see them branding it as like the City Field home opener, which is really funny, but it does it does add that extra that extra excitement to it. Like you said, the the fan fest should be cool, and um, yeah, I mean, we we need you to cleanse the palate. Um, yeah, you know, I, didn't, I didn't consider that this is your first time stepping back on the ground since since that night, so. It'll be interesting. I think you're right. We we probably, I don't know. There's something about City Field, especially last season. I mean, I was at one of the games when I think we score four or five goals. That was like the Brazilian Mafia night. Um, I think Keaton Keaton even got on the sheet for his first goal of the season in that one. So I like I like our chances. I think we're still awaiting that statement game that you've talked about for a few episodes. And uh, you know, I would love for it to be against a team that you know took took all three points from us in our season opener um took to kind of all the hopes and dreams and drowned them week one for us yeah i think well i just i just feel like the team feels the energy and how close the fans are to the team um when we play a city field it's just something it's completely different it is it feels like a home game which is ironic now that you know our home is going to be literally across the street um but it, it truly feels like a home game there um, and it's also wild, just based on the record of us uh, at Yankee Stadium, that that would feel less like home than City Field. Um, it just feels the atmosphere, at, <laughs> atmosphere there. Um, it's just top notch. So I'm excited to get back there. Hopefully, you know, I leave with a with a smile on my face this time, and um, <laughs> not just confused look like what the hell just happened. Um, but yeah. I'm excited about it. Uh, if you're going to be there, definitely come, come see us. Yeah, yeah, we'll be out. We'll be out at the fan fest. So if you see us, you know, don't be don't be afraid to approach. Um, and then I think one one cool thing to bring up. I think one of my favorite moments from the weekend. Uh, I do love how the Apple TV stuff has uh, all the MLS Next Pro stuff now. Um, but I actually caught parts of my first NYCFC two game. Um, but for the parts that I did catch, I saw Jason assisting hack which I, I think is a big moment for us we're obviously very very big hack supporters i don't know if we could call him a friend of the show um I but I, so. would, I would love to do that <laughs> um but uh yeah that was cool to see I, i'm happy to see i think in a lot of ways nycfc2 uh, maybe for the first time is feeling like uh something that is very valuable to the first team in the midst of turnbull getting the first first team contract ever coming up from the team obviously something we called for last episode pretty heavily um, especially you um is massive to have happen and then to see some fringe first team players definitely probably jason more than hack just because of the personnel that we have um but then i think jason had that assist to hack and then he had a goal as well um to see them staying in form and and you know keeping the muscles ready for potentially coming up and challenging that's that's pretty much all you can hope for. It makes it exciting too. Like when I tune into NYCFC two, and I now know Turnbull, Hack, Jason, Owusu, all these different guys as if you know they were first team players. Um, when in a lot of times in the past, I feel like I didn't really know the guys that were there. So yeah, no, it makes it way more exciting, and um, it makes you wish that these guys could come in and make those same impacts for uh, for the first team. Um, it mm-hmm. almost gives you that fantasy, like the fantasy uh, rose-tinted glasses that they are going to someday come in and be the world beaters that they look like 
uh, versus yeah. NYCFC two comp- opponents, but against all yeah. the academy kids. Yeah, literally against like high school yeah. kids. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean that that's that's pretty much ninety seven or ninety six, whatever it is. Um, ninety six, like like we done like me. Ninety six, like we said, we we will be at City Field, so you know, don't be strangers if you see us. We obviously won't be strangers out at the fan fest or anything. Um, we have to track down wherever all the rest of our stickers are. I actually don't know, but I have them. Well, oh, well, they're like they're, right, they're right, right under. There. I know exactly where they are. <laughs> yeah, well, the only thing about those is you know not having literally most, any players that are on the, the sticker at the, <laughs> at the club. The I think it's gone. Collins, Tati, and Sean, and they're all gone. So, uh, yeah, sending love to Tati too. I guess he he missed a sitter against the Barca keeper and you know deactivated the the instagram and the twitter you know how those nines can be emotional so yeah and that's no hate i i would literally i love that man so you know no hate but i i feel i do feel bad i guess corona fans are going to give him like an ovation uh in the ninth minute um so that should be pretty special like that's something that makes me want to tune in too so should be cool yeah yeah and i there's no blame for tati it's a tough tough position it was a tough angle um and obviously, Ter Stegen is the best keeper in the world right now, so you can't blame him at all. Um, yeah. But Tati, you're not hearing this, but if you do, keep your head up, man. We got you. Yeah. So, at Post Money Pod everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube has ads now. Um, subscribe on there, like the video if you make it this far, obviously. Uh, that helps a lot with us, so yeah. we'll keep turning these things out. Hoping for a big, a big win against Nashville, um, and yeah, yeah. peace, peace.